Well, hey, everybody, I hope you guys are having a great week. My name is Heidi St. John, and you have found me right here at the intersection of faith and culture. This is the Off the Bench podcast, and today I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about dysfunctional families. If you know one or you're from one, stick around. I think you're going to be encouraged. Well, thank you guys for tuning in today. I'm going to be spending my week in the great state of Colorado. For those of you who are following my travels, I will be uh, talking about my new book and how God works through families, particularly as it relates to answering the prayers of parents uh, at Focus on the Family this week. And then I'll be in Colorado for a little bit longer for an HSLDA board retreat. And so some of these podcasts have been pre-recorded in anticipation of my travels. So for the next couple of days, I'm going to be talking about something I know a lot about, and that is dysfunctional families. <laughs> some of you guys think that you've got the corner on the market for craziness in your family, but I'm telling you what, uh, everywhere we look right now, we see broken families, we see dysfunctional families, they're everywhere. And I want to encourage you because God has hope. Even for the craziness in your family, God wants to redeem it. And he's a God of miracles. He is still redeeming families today. He's been doing it throughout all of human history. He redeemed the massive mess that uh, Adam and Eve made in the Garden of Eden when they disobeyed God and caused sin to fall upon all of us. And he's still doing it today. And I wanted to take you to a passage of scripture. Actually, we're going to talk about a lot of different kind of family problems for the next couple of days because, man, we can learn a lot from the Bible. And God has so much encouragement for you and so much wisdom for you in the word of God. And we're going to we're going to spend a little bit of time today in the book of Genesis. So I'm going to read to you from Genesis 25. And I'm hoping some of you guys have your Bibles, which is fantastic. And if you don't just read along with me, because uh, the Bible tells us a lot about what it takes to raise children. And he uses uh, God does Broken families all throughout scripture. I mean, for goodness sake, David's family is pretty messed up. Abraham's family is really messed up. Jacob, Isaac, uh, Esau. And we saw this with Cain and Abel. There was murder from the beginning of time, right? Because it because of sibling rivalry, because of jealousy. And you think, I mean, it's easy for you to think probably right now that we look around and things are pretty messed up. But the fact is sin has messed up our families from the beginning of time. So Genesis chapter 25 opens up with the account of the death of Abraham and his descendants. Many of you may not realize, but he, at the beginning of this chapter, Abraham takes another wife. I gotta just say, can we just pause and say, the sister wife thing is never a good idea. <laughs> All right, we saw this with Abraham and Sarah, right? She desperately wants to have a baby. And so she finally says, listen, I'm never gonna have a baby. So go ahead and sleep with my handmaiden, Hagar, and Abraham does that. The Bible doesn't record whether or not he does it uh, necessarily reluctantly, but he does that. She gets pregnant, bears Ishmael. And this was all because Sarah doubted God's promise to her. He said to Abraham, your descendants are going to number the sand on the, on the, uh, on the seashore. Your, de your, no your descendants are going to outnumber the stars. But Sarah didn't believe God. And so because she didn't believe him, she doubted that that was going to happen through her, even though she was married to Abraham. So she says, go ahead and sleep with Hagar. Hagar then gives birth to Ishmael. And eventually Sarah does get pregnant, gives birth to Isaac. And what happens? Jealousy. Couldn't see that coming. Couldn't see that coming. But in uh, the opening of, of Genesis chapter 25, we read that Abraham took another wife. He lived for 175 years. The Bible says in verse 8, Abraham breathed his last and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years and was gathered to his people. Isaac and Ishmael, his sons, buried him. And now we're going to see the birth of Esau and Jacob. So in verse 19, it says, these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her. And she said, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. Now we're going to come back and talk about this stuff. I'm just going to read the passage straight through 
for you. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out, all of his body was like a hairy cloak. The first came out red, all of his body like a hairy cloak. So they called him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel. And so they called him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore these two boys. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Verse 28, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So now we're seeing some favoritism. We're already seeing uh, some similarities between Rebekah who struggled to get pregnant and her mother-in-law, Sarah, who had the same issue. And then finally in verse 29, once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came to him from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me have some of that red stew because I am exhausted. And therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. And Esau said, I'm going to die of what use is the birthright to me? So Jacob said, swear it to me now. So he swore it to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of stew. So Jacob gives Esau bread and lentil stew and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. And Esau despised his birthright. Now, there's so many things that we can learn from this. The Bible tells us that Rebecca was a kind woman. She was, uh, she was kind to strangers and animals. We read this in Genesis 24, verses 14 and 18. The Bible calls her beautiful in verse 16 of, of, uh, of chapter 24. And remember, we just read that Isaac was 40 years old when he married, and now he's approaching 60 years of age with no children as of yet. And if you study ancient Judaism, you learn very quickly that it was important for the young men and young women to marry very young. And if you weren't married by 20, they would say, dude, you, there's a curse on you. Something's definitely wrong. And so with Isaac and Rebecca waiting this long, there's no doubt that they felt maybe we're never going to have children. Maybe God's not going to answer our prayer. So let's look for a second uh, at what Jacob did in response to this. And I love this because we can learn so much from it in verse 19. Uh, so Isaac's 40 years old. When he marries Rebecca and they can't and they don't have any children. And Isaac prayed to the Lord because she was barren. And so we learn right away that that his solution to the problem that he was facing, unlike his father and mother, remember, Sarah, instead of instead of praying, she was like, well, I guess you can have my handmaiden. There's an idea. Well, that didn't turn out very well for her. And Isaac has learned from his parents. And so the Bible says that he prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer. And then Rebecca conceived. Now we look in verse 22 where they're having an issue again. Rebecca is struggling with her pregnancy. The Bible says that she was struggling because the children were struggling inside of her. And if, you know, those of you who've ever had a baby, if you've ever had multiples, my sister Hope had triplets several years ago. And I'm telling you what, uh, watching her belly you know, when she was getting near, uh, you know, six months pregnant, it was like, you know, watching acrobats happen uh, every night of the week. And it was amazing just to see the, the the twisting and the turning. I mean, I only ever had singletons and my, my, my husband and I would watch my belly. <laughs> you could see, you know, kicks and elbows and, you know, I can't even imagine. She actually comes to the Lord because the struggle inside of her between these two boys was so great. And she says to the Lord, why is this happening? She went to inquire of the Lord and the Lord answered her prayer. I think a large part of why God blessed this family was that they did what uh, their parents were unwilling to do and they went to the Lord. And so they handled their problem in a much different way than his parents did. And so remember, God's promise was that this family was going to have numerous children. God had promised that Isaac's descendants would be as numerous as the stars above. But unlike Abraham and Sarah, the Bible tells us that Isaac and Rebecca did not take matters into their own hands. Instead, they went to the Lord in prayer because they saw what happened when his father and his mother took circumstances into their own hands, right? Jealousy happened. Sarah became jealous. And so Jacob was like, I'm not doing this. I'm going to pray instead. And 
a lot of us are facing issues in our in our own families right now and the bible is telling us listen take it to the lord in prayer you got dysfunction in your family's history you got dysfunction you're a lot of you will say well i didn't come from a christian home i didn't see that modeled for me god gave us his word he says if any of you lacks wisdom ask it from me and i will give you the wisdom that you need to make a good decision god wants to do that i want to look really quickly at sibling rivalry because we also see this right conflict is going to happen in your family i don't care how great of a parent you are and how how wonderful you say your children are i don't know of any family that has not had trouble with siblings their sibling rivalry and this happens all throughout our lives right it happens when we're children for sure but then sometimes as we get older uh, it's easy for jealousy to creep in it's easy for one sibling to look at another one and think well how come that one is more successful than i am and certainly this is what happened with esau and jacob and as parents we want our children to get along right we want our children to be best friends forever there's a gazillion books written on this but you know what the answer is to harmony in your home it's a teaching your children to have the heart of god teaching them to love each other right and uh, and modeling this in your home for your for your children and then it's taking them to the lord in prayer because as our kids get older we learn very quickly that a lot of this stuff is just out of our hands right and so we have to take it to the lord in prayer and Jacob's brother Esau played a very powerful role in his life because when Jacob was alienated from Esau in the years to come, it haunts him, right? He's he's upset. The Bible is full of instances of sibling rivalry. Rivalry, most famous of all, Cain and Abel, which of course resulted in the murder of Abel by his brother Cain. And of course, again, this stemmed from jealousy. This stemmed from jealousy. You guys, if you got if you see jealousy in your home, if you see jealousy with between your children if you are a jealous person the the bible is very very clear this is a gateway sin to a whole bunch of other sins because that jealousy is like a root and once it gets its roots down deep into your heart and sort of tangles up your heart it's very hard to untangle it and so if you are listening to this right now and you either see jealousy in your children at home or you struggle with jealousy take it to the lord in prayer because Satan wants to get a hold of your heart and drag you off into the mud through the sin of jealousy. So Jacob, of course, wants his brother's birthright. Genesis 25, 27, when the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. But he was calculating and he was scheming and he schemed against his brother over and over and over again. Uh, I've heard him called a conniving opportunist. And his twin brother Esau was a free spirit who lived for his appetites, uh, every bit as emotional as his brother. And we saw that Esau makes this lifetime decision. He decides because he's hungry, I'm going to give you my birthright, right? This birthright that was given to him by his father, this causes so much pain. He exaggerates the situation. He says, I'm hungry, I'm dying. How many of us, how many of us have heard our children say that? I'm dying, mom, I'm so hungry. Well, this is a situation that was happening with Esau uh, at, at this particular moment. And Esau lacks the self-control and he sells his brother Jacob his birthright and it literally tears his life apart. And I got to thinking, you know, these decisions that we make. So a couple of weeks ago, I heard a, uh, a radio commentator who I actually really respect for the most part say that he did not think that pornography was wrong. Not wrong to view pornography because after all, the Ten Commandments, you know, uh, the Ten Commandments say, thou shall not commit adultery. And so to this person who is uh, a practicing Jew, he does not, this is where Judaism, I mean, come on. I mean, there's lots of places where it falls apart, but this is where it really hurts these people because he violates the spirit of the law while keeping the letter of the law. So because he doesn't, to him, it doesn't matter what Jesus says in the New Testament, right? Jesus said, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery with her, a clear warning against pornography. I mean, I have observed pornography tear apart marriage after marriage after marriage in my 35 years of marriage to my husband. And here this, this very well-known, very popular uh, radio personality says, well, it doesn't matter. Well, it actually does matter. And I have seen pornography bring uh, the integrity of a marriage 
down to absolutely nothing. And why? Because we wanted a momentary hit of dopamine. We wanted a momentary uh, satisfaction. And yet the Bible says over and over again, run from it. Well, this is what Esau is doing. For a momentary fix, right? He doesn't want to feel hungry. He sells his birthright. He sells his birthright. And I want us to think about this in our families right now. What is it the appetite that we have? We all have an appetite for something, right? The Bible teaches us that human beings are inherently bad. We're inherently wicked. David said that the human heart is evil. Who can know it, right? We have to teach our children to be good. They come to us with evil intent, right? And so when you hear someone say, well, men are, you know, human beings are generally good. The Bible would beg to differ. The Bible says that human beings are generally not good. We need the redeeming power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And this is true of every aspect of our lives. It's true when we're uh, parenting our children. It's true in our marriages. It's true when we look in the mirror every morning. And we know that sin issue that we're struggling with. The Bible teaches us that sin is literally crouching at our door, desiring to have us. And so we have to get a hold of it. Esau doesn't do that. He sells his birthright and it ruins his life. It ruins his life. And uh, we can see that the parents, so Esau's lack of self-control results in him giving up his birthright. Jacob, who's conniving, understands his brother's passion. He sees a weakness in his brother. And what does he do? He exploits that weakness. And yet, this is, and this is kind of the point. I'm going to uh, come back tomorrow and we're going to pick this up a little bit more. But the point that I'm trying to make today is that out of all of this brokenness, out of all of this uh, sorrow and all of the the uh, the yuck really that we see in these families, Jesus comes through the lineage of Abraham. Great things can come from broken families. Beautiful things. God makes beautiful things out of the dust. He really does. God specializes in redeeming messes. And the fact this family is included in our Bible really should make us go, you know what? Uh, maybe God has something for me after all, right? He can fix your dysfunctional family because God brought Jesus Christ through this family. That's the work of God. God is amazing. We serve an amazing God. So no matter where you came from, God's saying, I I can rewrite your story, can reroute this family, can change the destiny that maybe your dad or his dad uh, before him, maybe you feel like there is a legacy of divorce in our family, a legacy of jealousy a history of violence even, God can redeem it. God specializes in redeeming broken things. And as I was thinking about this today and sort of just reading again uh, in the book of Genesis, it's so fascinating, right? I, I love God's word and and we learn so much, but we can learn so much from just studying these people that God has given us the ability to see into their lives. Thank you to the Holy Spirit for helping these men write the word of God. But it's so important that we understand that there's no, uh, there's no mess that's so big that God can't still work in it. He is still at work. And whether you come from a, an abusive family like I did, whether you come from a massive uh, amount of dysfunction, God's saying, here's the guidebook for life. Follow me and see if I won't redeem it. Follow me and see if I won't make a beautiful thing out of this mess that you came from. God is in the business of redeeming broken families. He's in the business of redeeming dysfunctional families. Follow him and see if his word won't hold true in your life. So I'm going to put a little graphic of the lineage of Abraham to Jesus in the show notes today. And I found a great image off of BibleStudy.org. There's some really phenomenal family trees that sort of help us understand the lineage of Jesus. But I think it's so fascinating to study these people Abraham and Sarah, who had such a fascinating, interesting story, and God used their brokenness. And in their brokenness, they brought forth Isaac. And Isaac and Rebekah, in their brokenness, brought forth Jacob and Esau. And there was nothing perfect about these families. They struggled to walk with God. They struggled to obey. And God, in his mercy, redeemed their families. And he wants to redeem yours. It's a beautiful thing to see the lineage of Jesus through the lives of these broken people. And when we are frustrated, when we think, you know what? God's done, God's done working with me. My family's too broken. We've come too far. All you got to do is go back to the Bible and watch how these broken people were used by God to bring forth the savior of the world. I think it's so encouraging. And wherever you are, remember today that God wants to work through you, through your family, through your brokenness, in your mess, in your dysfunction. God wants to bring forth 
the delight of your children and your grandchildren for generations to come. So stay in the word today and study to show yourselves as approved workmen who don't need to be ashamed, who can rightly divide the word of truth. And read it to your kids, you guys. Read it to your kids. There's something beautiful about studying the word of God. It really is life changing. I want to invite you guys to the launch party for my brand new book, Mom Strong 365. On August 29th, seating is limited. But if you're anywhere out in my neck of the woods, we're going to be having a launch party. It's free. And we've got, I think, 150 seats available. Once it fills up, that'll be the end of that. But it's going to be a launch party. We're going to be giving away uh, gifts. The first 25 people that are in line that night will get a free copy of the book. And we're going to be giving away door prizes. There's going to be charcuterie. It's going to be great. And if you would like a copy of the brand new book, Mom Strong 365, Everyday Truths for Everyday Moms, it's up for pre-sale right now. And that book will begin to ship on September 5th. Thank you guys so much for listening. Have a great day. I'll see you right back here again at the intersection of faith and culture.